Hi, it's Dwyer, DwyerCrime.blog. Also, always, 1776.com. Today is April the 10th, 2024. Let's talk about a case, a murder case, that has always bothered me. And surprisingly, I just happened to be in front of my TV yesterday. And, believe it or not, this case was featured on A Wedding and a Murder. A new series that's excellent. I encourage people to take a look at it. The series focuses on, as you can imagine, murders that take place right around weddings. Right? This case is notorious. It's out of Saginaw, Michigan. Let's talk about it, but first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, I am not here remotely suggesting that Gabriel Ferris was husband of the year, right? This guy, let's just say, had a philandering eye that's shocking to even philanderers, right? If you believe the prosecution's theory, then the night of his wedding, when he was on his honeymoon, he leaves his wife at about 10 p.m., travels 65 miles to meet up with an ex-girlfriend, right? Apparently, he becomes enraged when he arrives at her place and realizes that she's upset that he's just run off and gotten married and she's not going to sleep with him. And if you believe the prosecution, the bedroom's upstairs, he loses it. He rapes her. Then he kills her. Her body is found positioned on the floor of the bed right by a dresser. And the police, of course, are able to find two of the defendant's fingerprints on that dresser. And if you believe the prosecution theory Right? Those fingerprints were left when he was leaning over her dead body. The fingerprints are pointed at a one o'clock angle. And they believe that he's over by her head and he's bracing himself with his fingers on the dresser. Now, let me just point out that a substance was found in the victim's private areas. The police at first believed that that substance came from a man who was infertile. Right? Understand that the defendant is not infertile. The defendant very much could have children. Right? There's no infertility with the defendant. Also, understand, when the police first found the body, they found dark hairs next to the body. They thought they were looking for a dark-haired man. Of course, the defendant here is blonde, as was the victim. Right, The hairs could not have come from the defendant. Now the defendant's defense, as you can imagine, and it's one his then wife supported for years, was that the defendant was with her. Right? The defendant had just gotten married. He's on his honeymoon. Why would he, the night of his marriage, leave to go get with an ex-girlfriend, right? So the wife, of course, when she was questioned by the police, said, hey, he was with me, 65 miles away from where this happened. Now let's pivot right here and make a few points. Apparently, not only was the groom dating 
the murder victim. In the days leading up to the groom's marriage to someone else. But apparently the murder victim had a boyfriend who she had just broken up with. Right, that boyfriend left hair samples in a hairbrush. The hair samples in the hairbrush look a lot like the hair samples left at the murder scene. Understand too, the bedroom where the victim was killed was upstairs where she lived, right? The dark-haired boyfriend's fingerprint was actually found on the banister leading up to the bedroom. Now, it might shock you that the dark-haired boyfriend was actually scheduled to leave the country to go back to his home country, Iran, in a week. After his ex-girlfriend is murdered, he speeds up his departure date. Folks, he's gone in a matter of days. When the cops try to question him, he's already out of the country. He leaves so fast, he doesn't even pack up all of his belongings. Some of his belongings are still in the United States. As the cops are finding out that he's left the country to go to Iran. So they get an arrest warrant. Excuse me. They get a warrant to talk with him. When they talk with him and they take his hair sample, they find that the hair sample he gives them in Iran somehow does not match the hair sample at the crime scene. Now I have a big question here. How could the hair at the crime scene appear to match the hair in the hairbrush, but not match the hair the guy provides them when they talk with him in a round? So understand how thin the evidence is here. The cops do not charge either the defendant, Gabriel Ferris, with the murder. Right? All they have are two fingerprints on a dresser and evidence that doesn't match him. Right? It looks like the murder rapist leaves infertile human fluid at the crime scene. It looks like the murder rapist has dark hair. Right? Understand, blonde hair from an intruder isn't found at the crime scene. Right? There are no witnesses, even though the defendant is known around town. Right? In fact, the defendant used to hit a bar um, with, at times, the murder victim up until the night of her murder. Right? People, people knew him in town. He was from a prominent family. But yet no one sees him at the murder scene. There's a paucity, now granted it's 1974, there's a paucity of any kind of DNA. Let's go one step further. The defendant admits that he used to go to the victim's house, be in her bedroom, because they were having sex. They were in a relationship. So even if you were to find a fingerprint here or there of the defendants, he would have an explanation, which was that the two of them were involved. Understand too, and it's very important. The murder victim has a roommate. Another woman lives in the house with the murder victim. In other words, the affair that the victim was having with the defendant was the kind of affair someone would have, and I call it affair, they were both single at the time, he ultimately gets married to someone else,
but they were both single at the time. The relationship the two of them had wasn't a discreet relationship. It wasn't clandestine. Rather, it was the kind of relationship someone would have while they're living with another young person. Right? The murder victim is 21. The defendant at the time, 27 years old. Right? So the defendant's position is simply, hey, we were involved. I was in the bedroom several times. Right? The night of the murder, I was with my newlywed wife, 65 miles away on my honeymoon. Right? Understand. The boyfriend who the murder victim just broke up with. The one who she had an argument with. The one whose fingerprint is on the banister. The one who has hair color that matches the hair color at the murder scene. He seems to me to be more likely a viable suspect than a blonde guy who was very fertile who has an alibi of being with another woman the night of the murders. Well, here's where things pivot. Let me also point out, too, that there is a 1999 decision by the Michigan Court of Appeals, right, that threw out the first conviction of Gabriel Ferris in this case. And there's a quote in that opinion. The quote talks about the, here's the quote, almost total lack of physical evidence linking defendant to the rape or murder. Let me repeat that. Almost total lack of physical evidence linking defendant to the rape or murder. Now the grounds by which the initial guilty jury verdict was thrown out by the court is that one of the witnesses who the prosecution chose to have testify in front of the jury was a jailhouse snitch who we are to believe more than 20 years after this murder when the defendant is finally charged with the crime. Understand, the murder victim, 21 years old. Add another 21 years to that. The evidence is so weak that they don't even charge the defendant with the crime for 21 years. Then, while he's in prison, he's supposed to have felt the need. <laughs> he's supposed to have felt the need to talk to a total stranger and to confess to the stranger that he killed his girlfriend because she had over 150 lovers and was disregarding his feelings. Right? Now, that's supposedly what the jailhouse snitch testified to the jury. The issue was whether that snitch had an expectation of leniency. Now, at this trial where members of the court understand you cannot suborn perjury, the jailhouse snitch was able to say to the jury that he had no formal deal for any leniency from the prosecution with regard to his situation, right? His lawyer was the one who stepped up later and talked about how there was an expectation that he would be cut a deal somewhere along the line. The Court of Appeal heard this in briefing and decided that this guy should never have been presented to the jury giving testimony about no expectation of leniency. That that was untruthful. So they threw out the initial murder verdict. But what's important is the jurists themselves, the judges sitting on the Court of Appeals, they recognized, in their words, that there was an almost total lack of physical evidence. 
right? We know there are two fingerprints on a dresser. The defendant, of course, claims he was over there many times. He may have put his keys down on the dresser. Um, in another statement to police, he said he may have opened a draw on the dresser at some earlier time, right? His explanation is, hey, we used to have hanky-panky over there. Um, I used to be around the dresser. Uh, if my fingerprints are there, then it's from some time when I was there. Fingerprints don't give you the time when they were left there, right? Unless the fingerprint is bloody and the blood could only get on the print at the time of the murder, fingerprints aren't a useful tool in terms of letting you know when the person was there. So I need for people to understand the rest of the evidence that the state of Michigan used to retry this defendant and to convict him of murder. Right, folks, I have a problem with this. It's my understanding, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that it's the prosecution's burden to show guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? It's my understanding, and please, in the comment section of this YouTube video, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought people were presumed innocent. It's the prosecution who has to convince you, the jury, that there's really only one reasonable explanation beyond a reasonable doubt. And that explanation is that this defendant did the murder. Right now, I don't know how you reach that standard. When the guy is blonde and the hairs at the crime scene are dark. They aren't blonde. Seems to me the forensics don't match. The other problem I have is if I'm to believe the guy is 65 miles away, right, shortly after his wedding, and then he travels 65 miles to rape and murder an ex in a scene that looks like a tussle took place, right? She has scratch marks. She has bruises. There's blood around her nose. Her lip is banged up, right? Folks, the scene reeks of a lack of consent. Now, if I'm to believe that this guy's emotional after getting married, travels 65 miles, kills an ex in a tussle, after raping her, and then leaves, and leaves behind bodily fluid. Right, to me, the guy would leave behind more than that. Right, if the guy is hurried, if the guy has traveled an hour to get to Saginaw, if the guy has broken into the house, as is suggested by the prosecution, they believe he came in through a window, it seems to me we would be finding his fingerprints on the banister, not a fingerprint from a dark-haired ex-boyfriend. It seems to me that if the guy isn't going to use protection to make sure he leaves no bodily fluids at the murder scene, if he leaves bodily fluids at the murder scene, it seems to me this guy's reckless. To me, the fact that all the guy leaves is just two fingerprints on a dresser is shaky at best. To realize that the cops would later back away from their theory that it was a dark-haired intruder and would then claim that the dark hair must have come from the rug. I'm not making this up. This is how shaky the foundation is of the prosecution's case, right? They're actually claiming at the trial that the blonde guy did it, even though there isn't his hair at the murder scene, right? And their argument is that they were mistaken, that the dark hair 
that they thought came from the murderer actually just came from the rug. Let's talk about the bodily fluid found in the murder victim during her autopsy. We later find out that the person who did the autopsy uh, did not know if that fluid was seminal fluid, right? We're hearing now that, you know, the theory has changed from an infertile guy to the idea that this unknown substance that's mentioned in the autopsy might not have been male seminal fluid at all. It might have been some other substance, right? Well, just understand that seems shaky to me, right? Isn't the allegation that the victim was raped and then murdered? Isn't that what the prosecution wants us to believe? Well, where is the showing that she was sexually assaulted by the defendant that night. Where's that showing? Understand, the Court of Appeal, again, found that there was an almost total lack of physical evidence. Where's the showing? So understand how weak the case was in my eyes. Right? Gabriel Ferris gets convicted, believe it or not. He's in prison as I'm making this video. This video is a cautionary tale to anyone who thinks that the state needs a lot of evidence to convict you of a violent rape murder. Right? The evidence against him really consists of the two fingerprints found at the murder scene, where, of course, he was having an ongoing relationship with the murder victim, right? Speculation on the part of many. On the show, A Wedding and a Murder, they have some great weaknesses, some great recollections of what happened. They actually interview the roommate the housemate who came home and said something was wrong and who then called the cops, right? She understood something's not right here. From the show, I'm not sure if she goes into the bedroom, but she senses that something's not right and she calls the cops. Here's the problem. She doesn't know what happened. She's not a witness to the murder. She doesn't know who did the murder. She did not see the defendant on the night of the murder. Right? Understand, too, you have a lot of cops commenting on the evidence, talking about what witnesses said. Well, from my review of the court record, right? The um, opinions that were issued in this case. Let's talk about what the supposed witnesses said. Understand it's the prosecution's position that this defendant, who they did not charge with this murder for 21 years, let me repeat that, 21 years. In other words, as long as the victim lived, right, she died at 21, it's another 21 years before they even charge Ferris with the murder. According to the prosecution's new theories, right, because the old one involved a dark-haired guy. The old one involves an intruder who was sterile. Right, the new theory the evolving theory, we'll call it, is that this defendant had a guilty conscience. He not only confessed to the jailhouse snitch guy 
who was so unreliable that at trial under oath, he could not honestly tell the jury that he had an expectation of leniency. But apparently, the prosecution wants you to believe that he confessed, the defendant here, Mr. Ferris, confessed to some people in his social circle. Let's talk about that. Leroy Hoffley. He was briefly a former roommate of the defendant. And he claims the defendant told him words to the effect that he was making love with the murder victim and that he didn't mean to do it. Now here is the problem. If I asked you, when are recollections most hazy? Right? Some people would say, oh, it's when you've been in a car crash, hit in the head, you have a concussion. Okay, great. But another time when recollections are hazy is when you've been smoking and or drinking. And when I say smoking, folks, I'm not talking about tobacco. I'm talking about cannabis. Now, just understand, Leroy here, the former roommate, admits that the conversation... <laughs> The conversation took place when defendant and he were drinking or smoking cannabis. Right, folks? That You know, to me, this is unreliable testimony. This is a recollection of someone who is drinking and smoking at the time he hears some line about, I didn't mean to do it, or something like that. Who knows? Who knows what the defendant meant if the defendant said it? If his smoking and drinking buddy remembered it correctly. Understand, too, that if this evidence came out during the first 21 years, after the murder, one would have expected it to lead to the arrest of the defendant and charging of the defendant at that time. You should view these supposed confessions for a high-profile murder like this in Saginaw with suspicion. Right, and you should ask for each of them. Why didn't the police act on this earlier? Or are there circumstances where even the police thought to themselves, this isn't enough to warrant arresting the guy for the worst possible types of crimes imaginable, a rape and a murder. Then there's Linda Fairbanks, a former girlfriend who claims that in 1976, right, two years after the murder, when, of course, she was with the defendant and someone else, and they were all drinking or smoking, right? Linda Fairbanks claims that he said, words to the effect, I'm going to censor it a little bit here. He said, I was climaxing. I didn't mean to do it, right, while they were smoking and drinking, smoking or drinking. Now, there's another person there with that, Patricia Skeeby. Now, understand, she is present when the guy supposedly is making this big confession, making it sound like he's intimate with the murder victim, and that things got a little bit out of hand. And he kills her, but didn't mean to. Well, again, let me ask the question. If he's intimate with the murder victim, where is the forensic evidence of that intimacy from that night? Right? The police have been all over the crime scene to the point where they gather black hair and then they reached the conclusion that it came from the rug. 
right? The cops have been through the murder scene. If you believe this guy's drunk, high statements, where's the forensic evidence to provide them with some authenticity? Well, just understand, with Linda Fairbanks and the defendant was a third party, Patricia Skeeby, and she remembers it differently. She's not sure if it was a confession. She's not sure if the defendant wasn't just putting himself in the position of whoever it was that killed his ex, right? She's unsure. She um, recalls him saying during that meeting that he needed to find the victim's killer before he died. Folks, that statement is inconsistent with the idea that he's the killer. Right? So just understand, this confession is so shaky that one of the people, <laughs> one of the people who was there is uncertain of whether the guy was actually saying he did it. And of course, there's his wife. Now this is the key witness in the whole thing. Right? She was questioned by police. She told police that the defendant was with her. Understand, that's the defendant's story. I was a newlywed. I was with my wife. Years later, and here's a shock, given the guy's infidelity. Years later, the two of them broke up. More importantly, for our purposes in this conversation, his wife then changes her story. The wife then claims that at 10 p.m., that night, the guy dresses up and says, hey, I've got to go to a, for a walk, words to that effect. And of course, he leaves. Then she claims that at about sunrise, he's back and there's blood on his clothes. She says to him, hey, you know, where'd you get that blood? basically, on your clothes. And he says, you know, I ran over a rabbit and the rabbit got caught in the wheel well and I had to get out of the car and get the rabbit out of the wheel well. The wife claims she looked at him. Now this is important here. It's June. It's mid-June. 1974. She looked at him. It's sunrise. She understood that she should not ask him any more questions. Now that's her testimony at the time of trial. Right now, folks, that's after she lied to the police for years. Now suddenly we're supposed to believe her current story disregard what she said before now that they've gotten divorced now that she's come to grips with the fact that she married a philanderer a situation that many couples would have hard feelings toward the other she now has a story that he left that night and then he comes back and she doesn't ask him hey where were you or anything like that she just says, hey, what's that blood? You know, what, what's going on with the blood on your clothes? And then he tells her a rabbit story. Right, folks? There's some problems here. The first is that the coroner believes that the murder took place between 5.30 and 6 o'clock. Right? The idea that he does the murder, then leaves, drives 65 miles. By the time he gets home, I'm not sure if it would have been sunset. Sunset might have been a little bit earlier. Understand, 
if the murder took place, let's split the coroner's report, right? 5.30 and 6, let's say 5.45, right? If the murder takes place at 5.45, he would get home about when? 6.45, maybe 6.35. Understand, the wife doesn't know with certainty what time he gets home. She just knows that the sun had just come out. Right? My argument to you is, I'm not sure if the timeline fits. The story also seems a little bit far-fetched because he leaves a scene, a murder scene, has the victim's blood visibly on him, and doesn't think to take off the shirt, right? Leaves the car with the victim's blood on him. Let's say he's speeding to get back to where he and his wife are having their honeymoon. If he stopped by the cops, how would he explain the visible blood that's on his shirt and his pants, according to his wife, in her current story, which contradicts her earlier story to police. Let's go one step further. There are two witnesses who, believe it or not, told the police that they saw the murder victim and the defendant on the night of the murders at a bar. So now the story's shifting. Right? It's shifting away from this guy slipping out at 10 to this guy actually going to a bar with the murder victim. Right? Here's the problem. Both of those witnesses previously told the police that they did not know where the defendant was the night of the murder. So let's look at these witnesses who the prosecution is trotting out or trotted out successfully to get this defendant convicted of murder. There's the jailhouse snitch, who of course gave such unreliable testimony that the cops threw out the initial guilty verdict. There are, there's the former roommate who's drinking or smoking with him. Both guys may have had diminished recollections of that time and, of course, claims that the guy said that he didn't mean to kill her, right? Even though there's no forensic evidence that we know of that this fertile guy actually had sex with the murder victim the night she was killed. Then you have two women who have different recollections of a conversation. One of them recalls him saying, I've got to find who did this before I die in that conversation. Folks, <coughs> this is weak evidence if you were trying to convict someone of a robbery. Here, you're trying to convict someone of rape and murder. This evidence is weak. You have a court who already found that there is an almost total lack of physical evidence in this case. Folks, there's almost a total lack of reliable eyewitness evidence in this case. How much stock are you going to put in his ex-wife's testimony when he's not charged for the murder for 21 years? When she literally is misleading the police for years, doesn't come clean with this version until her marriage does not work. Right? So, I believe in criminal law, you have to look at some people and you have to realize that, okay, this guy certainly doesn't have my vote for husband of the year. But that's not what he's being charged with. He's not being charged with infidelity. He's being charged with rape and murder. Right? As I see it, like the court, 
there is really very little physical evidence. And the eyewitness testimony, which involves a lot of drinking or smoking, is weak at best. We don't have anyone who sees him speeding away from the scene of the crime. We have no one who sees him in the house. And most importantly, this is an involved murder where the victim is roughed up, is bruised, is scratched. Right? We don't have that on him. We don't have his seminal fluid at the murder scene. We have two fingerprints which could have been left at any time when the guy was in the house earlier during his relationship with the murder victim. I don't like the guilty verdict in this case. I think it hurts the system when people are convicted of serious crimes on such little evidence. And let's just say the eyewitness testimony Oh, come on. That's, that's about as shaky as it can get. Let me just say, we've all heard someone who's very drunk, running off at the mouth, talking gibberish. Right? To make the statement that anything this guy has said is a shut and dry confession in a case where there is very little forensic evidence to me, discredits the system. Those are my thoughts as I make this video understand. Mr. Ferris is in prison, convicted of murder. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. I encourage everyone to watch a wedding and a murder. Let me point out too, We'll look back on shows like this in a few years, and we're going to realize how lopsided they were, right? The cops have detailed narratives about what they believe happened. And you realize that this is a construct for one cop, right? This isn't evidence that would prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. In my opinion, they don't come close to that. The jilted ex-wife, wow, she's the star witness. Who would have thought that up? Right? The people around him, you know, let's just say it's interesting. Two people saw him at a bar with the murder victim, right? Believe it or not, a judge put that in a dissent in the case. Mentioned that two people saw him in a bar the night of the murders. Then you come to find out that those two people both told the cops earlier that they didn't know where the defendant was the night of the murder, right? When the witness testimony is that shaky, the prosecution, in my opinion, didn't have a case, right? You know they didn't just off the gap in time between the murder and when he's charged with the crime 21 years later. That's how I see it. Let me hear how you see it in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.